you gave you gave a really good just bit there um a moment ago on how the 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 conscious agent does not see the and i think this this is extremely important but like the rain of photons that are coming right now and this big um field of nitrogen and oxygen uh molecules in front of my face um the electromagnetic spectrum that we only see from 400 to 700 nanometers on um the fact that we don't see any of those things is precisely be because it, we potentially designed it this way so that we could act in the ocean of that we're in uh to have experiences because if you couldn't have those experiences if you were blocked by the ocean of the electromagnetic spectrum and the sea of oxygen and nitrogen that you're in does that generally about right too right from an evolutionary point of view that would be the kind of argument that um you you want to evolve sensory systems that tell you what you need to know to act in ways that will keep you alive, you know, that will keep you fit. But um, you want to do it as cheaply as possible, right? Every calorie that you spend on perception is a calorie that you have to go out, kill something, and eat it to get that calorie. So there are selection pressures for uh, to, to dumb things down to keep our senses as simple as possible, um, given the, the other pressure of they have to be complicated enough to accurately report fitness, at least more accurately and, and more fitness than, than your competition. There's, there's nothing that in evolutionary theory that says that you are perfect about seeing fitness either, right? So I'm not, I'm not being um, a theorist that says we're, we have vertical perceptions of, of even fitness payoffs. There's, there's nothing vertical here anywhere. We, we have what we call satisficing solutions in evolution, right? Is good enough to just beat the competition. And so, so in, in, from that point of view, from evolutionary point of view, and, and again, you, you can see my attitude is, look, I'm not saying that evolution by natural selection is true, uh, but I'm saying we have no better theory, right? That, that is the best theory we've got. So, so until we have a better theory, we've got to take it very, very seriously in, uh, in what it says and then try to break it, right? I mean, be icon so we have to respect it, really study it, and then also try to break it. So, so what that theory is saying is, yeah, uh, there's no selection pressures for you to know everything. Quite to the contrary. All you need to do is be a little bit better than the competition. And so why should we see the, the, the deep structure of, you know, of atomic nuclei or the, the wavelength structure of, of photons and so forth? And, and, and the fact that we, in science, uh, you know, run into these things is, is interesting. What we're doing is we're studying our headset, right? Our headset has evolved with certain structure to it. What, like we have a, a space time that we perceive intuitively, you know, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. But when we actually study our perceptions more systematically, we, we realize, you know, Einstein comes along and, and, and uh, comes up with surprising features about our interface that eventually lead to posing that there's a Minkowski structure to space-time. And then eventually even a curved space-time you know, comes up with a, a, a curved space-time. And then when we, so what's happening is we're taking the language of our senses, the language of our interface that was evolved, and what science is do, has been doing is studying our interface. We haven't been studying objective reality. We've been studying our interface and its structure. And even microphysical particles like quarks and gluons and leptons um, are, the physicists will tell you, they're just what they call irreducible representations of the Poincaré group. But that means that they're, they're representing symmetries of space-time. We have this space-time format for our headset, and particles are just representations of the symmetries of that, of that formatting system. And so, so, yeah, we haven't seen all this stuff in, um, until science came along and, it, and what science has been doing is systematically exploring our headset. Um, and, and, and it's taken a lot of hard work, right? I mean, 
thousands of brilliant scientists working really, really hard, which gets back at your main point, which in some sense from evolution, we weren't evolved to see this, otherwise it wouldn't be that hard. We would just see it. So, so why, it, it just takes like, it takes an Einstein, it, it, it takes, you know, we, the people who actually figured this stuff out, we, we, we view them as absolute geniuses, right? I mean, the, because in some sense, the, the rest of us mortals uh, would never have even thought of that. And so there are a few of us, like the Einsteins and the John Wheelers and, 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 and so forth, who have these really deep insights um, and then the rest of us, um, you know, feel smart uh, by association. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, absolutely. A, a power law of uh, brilliant people that have pushed the edge of what is known. One billion people have been uncommon and 99 billion people have been common. And um, yeah, yeah. And the ones that are uncommon are the ones that uh, make the mutations on that uh, universal constructor um, that we're a, a part of. And the, then that tape, uh, then a hundred years later, we're all flying airplanes, you know, uh, style. Um, yeah. The, um, the, the other, the other thought for me around um, the perception, as you were indicating a moment ago, which I think is really valuable is that when 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 one augments their user interface when one augments their perception um in a sense what they do is they they kind of like climb the ladder of abstraction um but what happens is they like they see the world in a higher resolution like when when we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum in the sea of of oxygen nitrogen etc that that is that's here the photons etc all all that all that we're we're, we're, we've done is we've conceptualized these things, then we've stored it, but then we don't continue seeing it all the time. So, right. yeah. So, so this is a key insight, I think, is you rise to the levels of abstraction of knowing this, and then you store it as a concept. So like you double click in, you see the higher resolution, and then what you do is you zoom back out and you've stored that data and then you go about your the rest of your, um, the, whatever the function is. And like you described earlier, there's many ways up this mountain. So we're not just saying that it is only um, procreation, but that is definitely high. And uh, truth is also high. The more that you know of, about truth, the greater chance you have of getting a mate as well. Um, but people that are tuned specifically towards um of fitness payoffs, like you indicated, um, versus just truth payoffs. Um, fitness payoffs will win out um, over that, but there is there is an an, an overlap there. But I, I appreciate that that understanding of of upgrading perception and then and then holding that as abstract concepts that you can access any time versus not even having. That. Right. Yeah, that that that's a good point in the sense that um, even the best of scientists when they reach some deep new understanding like quantum theory and you find that that these you know electrons and photons are in superposition states and they get entangled and so forth um the best and brightest you know like richard Feynman will say look um if you think you understand this you don't understand this no no one understands this this is just this is mind-boggling stuff and and so the, these geniuses who who are at the forefront of under who are working on it will will say that it it, it just shatters all of your your intuitions and from an evolutionary point of view you could say well no surprise i mean we weren't in some sense evolved to understand the subatomic world and and so our our concepts and intuitions just aren't matched to it and when we get there we get there by mathematics right the the we're forced to these conclusions because we we try to get some mathematics that will explain our experiments and when we get the mathematics and we're finding, oh, wow, finally an equation that matches the data. So what does this equation entail? It entails that. Are you you got to be kidding me. It means that there's superpositions, that there is entanglement. Uh, I don't even know. This is it, it, and, and so then you have the really brilliant people going, I have no idea what, what this really means. All I know is that that's what the math is saying. And, and my intuitions are, are, are boggled. And so so that's that's where we are on that and there in terms of perceiving the truth and and, and getting mates um yeah mentioned um 
from an evolutionary point of view, there is an interesting, for, for our species, um, there's an interesting sexual selection pressure. So a male that has special linguistic or cognitive abilities can, by showing off, perhaps be more attractive to females. That's just one way that you can show off. You can also show off by being physically strong, right? And fast or muscled. There's a number of ways of, of showing off, but, but there are some selection pressures for, for women to uh, be more attracted um, to, to males with um, better displays of cognitive abilities. Mm -hmm. and, and that can lead not necessarily to truth, but to just making up really impressive stories and, and just trying to look impressive. So, so the, it, the alphabet soup logical fallacy. Right. So, so they're, they're, you know, just performing in a way that makes you look impressive may or may not be necessarily moving toward the truth. Now, in the case of an Einstein, right. Um, um, but if you've stored this data, like if you've stored the quantum field around the tree with the exchange that is happening of photosynthesis between the human and the tree in terms of O2 and CO2, if you've stored that data, if you've stored also how you eat the apple that's went through the photosynthetic process of making the glucose, and then you eat that and you go through the cellular respiration process, if you've stored these pieces of data um, and you know them, and mm -hmm. you can recall them, they give you a scientific and a spiritual fitness advantage in that sense over other potential mates for whoever that, that doesn't know that data. Absolutely, in, in the following sense. I mean, knowing that kind of stuff, I, I know um, things that could change my behavior so that I would eat more healthily and, and, and be more healthy that way. Or I could um, devise new technologies that allows me and my tribe to beat the others. And, and therefore be more fit in that. So absolutely, that's one thing that's driven science is the need for technologies to fight other human beings. <laughs> um, so a lot of, I mean, so, and, and it works, right? It's, you know, the United States is the world superpower, not because um, we're the smartest people or the strongest people or the bravest people. We just happen to have the best technology. That, that's, that's, that's it. There, that's, so it's really, in that sense, the fitness in an evolutionary sense goes now with great technology. In the past, it was, um, you know, who knew how to throw sticks and, and rocks better and then figure out levers and then bows and arrows, right? That was, a you know, bow and arrow, unbelievable technology. It gives you an incredible advance until the other tribe figures out, oh, look what they did. And they, so now you get this arms race. And so that is, so you're, you're right that there is in some sense this, this uh, fitness payoff for, better and better technologies, absolutely. And, and that um, is one of the selection pressures, uh, sexual selection pressures. Women will be impressed not just with brawn, but also with brain yeah. in our species. Yeah. So, so interesting on that point. Um, let's, um, let's talk about, um, and everything that we just mentioned, would it be fair to say that those are upgrades in perception in your multimodal user interface, that these are upgrades that we can make? Like if your dashboard sees like from the old school days of how to make the bow and arrow or from today's modern day, maybe you know how to use Python to program a computer, that maybe that if you have those little icons on your multimodal user interface, that maybe then, in this interface theory of perception, if I can perform some mimesis and I can learn how to do the bow and arrow, or I can learn how to do the Python programming and add that to my multimodal user interface of perception, that then, then that is um, the upgrades in perception, augmentations in perception that enable me to climb those ladders of, of fitness and abstraction and truth and stuff like that. That, that's right. It, it's, it's an upgrade, not in the sense of the basic hardware of the brain, right? The, the, the hardware of the brain that you got is what you've got. But you can, because our, our, our brains are, have evolved to be learning algorithms, and, we're, and we, we learn and build models, and if a lot of other people around us that we see have figured out models that we might not have figured out on ourselves, we can effectively be more smart because we can, instead of figuring it ourselves, we can just adopt their model. Now we have their model, even if we weren't smart enough to actually figure it out 
ourselves. And so as our population has gotten bigger, you know, 7 billion or 8 billion and so eight forth, billion, yeah. there, you know, right. There's, there's a, when you have that many people out there, there's going to be some, some real geniuses who will come up with big ideas. Like there, there'll be an Einstein. And we, we all talk about Einstein and there are a billion other people that we're not going to talk about from, from 1905. <laughs> um, yeah. That, that, and, but the, the, you know, the zero to one and then the one to many, as Peter Thiel would say. Yeah, th That's right. But there is a, a, I'll tell the opposite side of this now. And that's, it's, it's quite remarkable. Um, our brains in some sense are not upgrading. They're downsizing. That's right. Yeah. The, what is it? Is it the volume of a tennis ball we've lost in the last 20,000 years? That's exactly right. Um, so the peak was 15, 20,000 years ago. And apparently then what, what seems to be going on, um, well, well, what, what is going on in the data is that they can measure the, the, the volume of the, of the skulls, the cranium, so that you can measure, you know, the brains are gone, but you can see the volume that they occupied. And so you can actually measure, and we've lost in the last 15, 20,000 years, 10%, um, 15% of our, our brain volume, or, or the, 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 about the entire volume of a tennis ball is gone. So it's, it's truly stunning. And, and, and apparently we got smart enough 15,000 years ago to create agric agriculture. And with agriculture, we started to get now with, to support agriculture, you need to bring um, a bigger social group. We have small social groups as hunter gatherers, but now you need to bring together bigger social groups. And you had to have a bigger division of labor because you know, we had to be you know, tending the crops um, working on the crops, um, we could then we needed people to defend the crops because the hunter gatherers are going to come through and just try to steal it from you, right? So you got to now you have to have a standing army. They can't be always d doing the crops, and so you get this division of labor that's that's coming out. But once you get a division of labor, um, I don't have to be smart about everything. Now, you, if I'm a hunter gatherer, me and my small group, we have to do everything or we die, right? We have to make our clothes. We have to take care of ourselves when we're sick. Everything that we need, we've got to do ourselves or steal from somebody. <laughs> and, but in a, in a greater selection pressure for being a polymath 20,000 years ago. And then the slowly we've relieved those selection pressures today right. where you're just exchanging the sheet of paper for the apple <laughs> instead of growing it yourself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. IQ of 70 and just go to the store and get my food. <laughs> As you know, I mean, IQ of 70, probably, you know, during the 15,000 years ago, uh, I would have been run over. It, it, so it's, uh, you know, it's, so it's a use it or lose it kind of situation or, or use it, it. You only get it if you need it. And since um, I don't need to do everything, I don't need to be a, a genius at everything as much as before, I'm not. And so our brains are being downsized. I, I, as as also we're at least you know we have this access to the internet and we're moving into the genetic engineering the neural prosthetic ages that we're getting potentially the assistance of these AGI coaches and we can maybe learn how to augment our working memory to twenty um, plus or minus two and maybe we can abstractly reason such no novel concepts that have never been thought of before and um, but. Uh, so maybe there is a way to kind of bounce back from that loss. Uh, maybe um, that would be, that would be good. Um, and yeah, yeah. Um, let's, let's, this is good. That, that was a good bit on those um, augmentations. I definitely think that um, there's many other um, augmentations that, that exist like Entheogens is a is a prominent um, augmentation that exists. Um, deep the depth of meditative experiences, the deepest depths of those as well, um, augment one's perceptions. Also enable them to really um, understand what the pause is. Instead of being so reactive, they can uh, they know how to slow down and just observe. And then, um, which is game changing for your relationships with your family, your friends, your coworkers, people online. Line, blah blah and so all of a sudden just from something that doesn't appear to have a high fitness payoff right it doesn't appear to have a high fitness payoff but really when you learn how to pause instead of immediately react um, it gives you tremendous uh, fitness payoff downstream yeah. I, I, I would agree in, in, in the sense that 
especially like in, in our society right now, right? Um, most of us aren't facing on a daily basis um, immediate threats to our, our bodies. Like it's, you know, there, of course, I mean, there are many murders in the United States and around the world, but, but it's, you know, as, as Pinker has pointed out, as Stephen Pinker in some of his books, um, the rate of, of homicide is dropped dramatically over the centuries, dramatically. And, and so we have the luxury now of not having to look over our shoulders every moment, you know, w w worrying whether some other human being from another tribe is, is going to be attacking us yeah. or, or so forth. And so, so it's, it's, it's interesting that if you're in a situation where you're in a war zone and um, there are imminent threats all the time, then being anxious and being alert is very, very fit, right? It's very, very important. Eventually, that anxiety and the cortisol that it produces will kill you, yeah. but it won't kill you today, and it, it will keep you alive today. So in that sense, it's more fit. But now, yeah. we have this luxury. We're not an imminent threat. Uh, there's not imminent danger. So if we're in the state of, of high stress and anxiety and so forth, producing cortisol all the time, we are unnecessarily shortening our lives. Yeah. If I was in a war zone, I would be necessarily shortening, shortening my life but to stay alive today. So, so with meditation and so forth, we can move into a greater sense of, of peace and reduced stress and anxiety. We can reduce our cortisol levels um, and we can enjoy that, that state of, of life. Now it's because of our, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, um, we are programmed with a stress system, right? We have an amygdala, we have all, the, we're, they're there um, because that's what kept us alive. We are the offspring of those who are anxious enough to be able to face the threats successfully, right? So that's why we have this proclivity to be anxious. Um, there are variations among us, but as, it, I mean, there's this video I saw in, in some a National Geographic um, show about nature or something with a bunch of monkeys in, in the wild, but they're all the monkeys are up in the trees and in hooting, hollering, and so forth, up, except for one. And this one monkey was this uh, really relaxed, laid back monkey out in the grass. On, you know, and while they're filming, they happen to some tiger or panther comes along, and guess who he got it? Yeah, yeah. That that relaxation gene just went out of the gene pool. It was the only it was only the monkeys that were uptight and scared enough to stay in the trees that's that that passed on their genes and so so we we are the offspring of those who were are you know anxious enough so so from an evolutionary point of view um there's a clean reason yeah. why most of us face stress and anxiety even when we don't have to like we, we feel it when we don't have to so evolution uh, you know programmed us that way but but meditation is something that we can now do when we have the luxury of not being in a war zone not being attacked all the time, yeah. then we can, you know, take the bull by the horn and say, look, um, I don't need to be anxious all the time. Even though I've been programmed by natural selection to be anxious, I, I can choose to meditate and literally reprogram my brain circuits to be more relaxed. Uh, and I will enjoy my life more. Yeah. And, and statistically, I will live longer. Yeah, there's there's many uh, variables in our user interface that uh, sometimes seem to uh, not have a high fitness payoff, but they're um, because most of the high fitness payoffs just appear to be the short term gratifications um, and also the um, uh, things involving money, but the things that are sometimes involving learning how to do things that are maybe thousands of years old, like learning how to investigate your own consciousness and awareness and calm down and be, become more peaceful and joyful that uh, doing that doesn't seem to immediately have a, m a monetary or fitness payoff, but it, but I think there are many things like that that exist that um, get you closer to, to truth, get you closer to peace and joy um, that actually do give you better downstream fitness payoffs. Because that's the thing is that mates given procreation um, 
men and women both that don't have as uh, keen of an interest for truth, um, they're, they, in a sense, it feels like there's less soul there. There's more soul with people that have a depth of interest in truth. And also we as a society need to do a better job at creating the economic incentives that make it so that young children can explore metaphysics and consciousness as a profession and get paid for it too. So if there's, you know, money intertwined with truth more carefully, then maybe some of those conscious agents could win, um, over people that just focus on fitness um, and, and, and money. So, yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and um, again, as I said before, you know, I, I, as a scientist, I'm always just sort of saying what different theories entail, right? And so I've been very, very careful to say that this is what evolutionary theory entails and so forth, but, but that I don't necessarily believe the theory. But now what you're saying is very interesting. Suppose, uh, you know, now, now forget evolutionary theory. Suppose that there's a deeper theory in which consciousness is fundamental. And in some sense, maybe the dynamics of consciousness is really what it's about is the exploration of consciousness. That's what's really yeah. deep, meaningful in this deeper <laughs> realm of consciousness, right? And and so, Perfect so segue. Yeah. then it puts a very different spin on the whole meditation thing than the spin I just gave, right? The spin I just gave was from an evolutionary point of view, which says uh, it, it's just a way of countering the the built-in anxieties that we have. And so that was, that was, that was you know, bracketed within that theory. So now I'll put that theory aside and say, okay, that's what that theory entails. But there's this other framework entirely different in which consciousness is fundamental and it's what it's all about. So in that case, then meditation might not be just this side little issue to make us more comfortable. <laughs> be that that's only, that's when we really wake up to what we're really about. That, that maybe we're immersed in a game, but the point of the game isn't to win the game maybe the point of the game is to wake up, yep. realize who we are, and maybe playing the game is a way of more, more deeply understanding um, who we are as conscious beings. And, and so maybe most of us just don't wake up in this game. So, but again, notice, I'm not saying that I know that this is true. And, and that's the key thing. Dogmatism, from my point of view, is the, is the, the worst thing we, we could ever have. Yeah. Dogmatism, assuming that I know the truth, is the way that you stop inquiry. So, so I, I always want to say this is now. I'm bracketing it with this theory. In a theory in which consciousness is fundamental, then it would, it would have this different spin on things. And so that's what we we should always, even if that's right, you can never know that you're right. That's the weird thing about this. So this is the human condition. We can never know for right. We can find out in many cases that we're deeply wrong. But but we can never. So there's this deep humility that we need to have in yes. anything we claim um it's rather uh, so the way i like to think about it I, I propose the theoretical framework in which i'm going to speak and then say within that framework this is what it entails but of course the theory could be wrong so here's the, here's what evolution entails here's what the theory in the, which consciousness is fundamental entails um but but maybe both theories are deeply deeply wrong and so then let's talk about a different framework right and and so that's how we we yes yes the theories as opposed to being attached to them yes it's an anti-dogmatic kind of point of view it's more um exploring and and if we assume that we know then we cut off inquiry and we can't learn if you know if, you, if you're certain that you know then you're not going to be motivated to learn yeah this is paramount um balancing excitement with uh, non-dogmatism because you have to have confidence in what edge you're trying to push and you have to have humility as well uh, exactly you're critical. exactly about that's that's the knife edge i agree with you yeah. <laughs> see it's not easy for us to to maintain that but it's really critical it's so, so critical. Um, but because especially sometimes young people are, are trying to push with confidence something that may be actually really critical to get to the edge and beyond the edge. But then there are influences of maybe parents or community or friends that are just hating on them um, moving that forward. And so the, the, we, there's also the importance of, of, that, of that confidence and courage to, to get to, to that edge and to, to push it and rocket it forward. It's very important. Oh, absolutely. I think that, that you've touched on a really important point. I mean, so the, the theory that I'm working on right now, I, I'm excited about it. I've, I've got energy. I, you know, I think I'm onto something. 
but and so you and you need to have that kind of energy and that kind of enthusiasm to push forward right but then you, i always step back and go but of course i could be wrong i mean i hope i'm not but you be you, but you know you have to have that 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 dual understanding about the whole situation so yeah be motivated be excited but but not dogmatic that's the knife edge yep yep those are some of the codes that we are archiving from the dirty bathwater is the dogmatism and the fundamentalism. And we're taking the baby out, um, the, the scientific method, we're taking out the hierophanies, these sacred divine communions and experiences, subjective ones that people do have and sharing those better. 